Hey, Sabrina Washington. Thank you for joining, Sabrina. Thank you for having me, Joel. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> she is a woman after God's own heart, and she is just full of the word. And so we are just going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about righteousness, God's righteousness. Remember, we're talking about an open invitation book that you can get a free download at kingdomreignministries.com. Get your free copy. God told me to give it away for free. He wants to recalibrate his church. And so this topic that we're talking about tonight, righteousness and justice, is based on God's righteousness and his justice. And so chapter one is dealing with um, to know God and to know his ways. And so we're going to finish up um, this week and next week on chapter one. But tonight we're going to talk about God's righteousness and his justice. So, as you guys, most of you guys know, I like to always start with the definition. What is righteousness? What is judgment? I mean, um, justice. And so, one of the things I want you guys to know is that they're both synonymous. You know, righteousness and justice are really synonymous. There is a little difference, but for the most part, most part, they are the same. And a lot of times in the Bible, it may not have justice. It may not have righteousness every single time. It'll talk about just, or it'll talk about right, or it'll talk about fair, saying the same thing pretty much. It's just breaking it up. Um, and so we want to remember before we go to the definition that God is righteousness. He's justice, right? God always does what is right is who he is, he is just right. You cannot go before, just like the government. I think um, if some of you might know that you cannot sue the government, right? You can't go to a higher power to sue the government because the government is the government, right? <laughs> God, you can't go no higher, God is right. <laughs> That's a really good analogy. <laughs> God is just right. I mean, yeah. you can't you can't try to take him to court and try to, you know, make him out to be wrong. God is right. Bottom line. Um, it's the natural expression of his holiness. He, he, he does what is just. He does what is fair. He does what is right. It's who, it's who he is. So the, um, the definition of righteous is observing divine laws. A person who is righteous is one who observes divine laws. They wholly conform to the will of God. They are approved or acceptable, approved of or acceptable of God. Those are who are considered righteous. Um, you wanna add anything to that? No, oh, I I love that, especially um, the approved part and holy unto the Lord. So I don't want to go into I don't I don't want to get ahead of you, but yes, I I love that it it definitely fits with um, with why we need the Lord. I'll just say that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. So, so yeah. So let's talk about approved. You said you like the part that said approved of. So there are people in the Bible that were considered righteous, right? That God approved as being righteous. And so that's where we'll go since you started that. The very first scripture, when it, if you look up righteous, the very first scripture that you'll see about righteous is Genesis 7-1. And this is where Noah, in verse 7, 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you with all your household, for you alone I have seen as righteous. And then it has in parentheses, doing what is right before me in this generation. That's so good. So <laughs> Noah... 
was considered, he was approved of and acceptable to God because God said for himself, I have seen I have seen as righteous before me and that you have been seen as righteous alone. You have been doing what is right. Noah, you've been doing what is right. Nobody else, nobody else was saved in that flood because judgment came. So here's the justice of God, okay? The justice of God, God hates sin. He hates it. The sin is not of God. It is it is you doing your own thing, not doing the right thing, not doing what God is saying to do. And so sin brings God's justice. And that's why no one on the earth at that time was found righteous except for Noah and his family. And they were the only ones that were saved. That says a lot. That says a whole lot. <laughs> A whole lot. Yeah. That sounds a whole lot. That God, you know, we would we don't want to think about justice. We don't want to think about God's wrath. We don't want to think about, you know, God um doing then, you know, he said he'll never do the flood again. So thank God for that. But we don't we don't want to see his wrath, but sin on the earth will see God's wrath. It has in every generation, it has in every, in every Bible story where there's sin, there is the wrath of God. And just his um, patience, his enduring patience, because um, what was it, Methuselah was 900 and some years old. I mean, so this had to go on for a long time. Before, yes, you know, I mean, That's so good. he's just so, so very patient, unlike man, where we would be so swift to, you know, give our, what we would call justice. justice right. <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, we want justice and he really um, endures. He really does. Yeah. You know, just goes to show you. Um, why he's God. I mean, he does not judge and he, he does not judge like we do. Yes. He does not. Exactly. There's, there's no comparison. Yeah. And, and because we haven't had judgment due to the sin that's on the earth, people feel like they're, you know, they can continue to do it. And you can't, like, eventually he, what he's trying to do is to get his loving kindness, his fairness, his justice, is trying to get people to move back in alignment with him. And it's like he said, it takes a while because he, his mercy, his mercy towards us. Yes, and that there's a scripture, Lord help me, what is it, where it, he says, and I'm just paraphrasing, that my kindness, so to speak, is meant to cause you to turn away, to do what is right. It's meant to help you become right in my sight. Amen. But yet you, <laughs> you know, we want to, it's almost like we look at it as being okay, so we can continue to do what we're doing. Right. Because, you know, he hasn't smacked our hand or he hasn't put the hammer down. So it's like we take his kindness almost as a approval, really. Yes, yeah. To, to stay in our sin. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And if anything, we should be in worship of his thanking him for his mercy, you know? Um, Righteousness, so the definition of righteousness means integrity, virtue, purity of life, um, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So uh, the first time that we see righteousness is in Genesis 15, 6. So the first one, the first time we saw someone being righteous is Noah and his family, that they did what was right. 
The first time that God said that uh, talked about righteousness is Genesis 15, 6 in the Amplified. And it said, so God was telling Abraham that he was going to have a child from his own body, which, you know, Abraham was like, I'm old, you know, Sarah was old. And, you know, he's like, I, you know, what are you saying, Lord? And the Lord was saying, look, you're going to have so many heirs. You're going to have a, you know, from your, from your womb is going to come this mass of people, which is, you can't like the stars. You can't even count the number of stars in the sky. And Abraham, like, I don't even have an heir right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? But in the end, when God said it, he believed him. And so in verse six, it says, then Abraham believed in, which means he affirmed, he trusted in, he relied on, and he remained steadfast to the Lord. And he, God, counted or credited to him as righteousness, doing right in regard to God and man. So here you had another person who the main thing was righteousness is believing in the Lord. If you take out, it says, then Abraham believed in the Lord. And that was, was counted to him to righteousness. So believe, you know, is doing, you know, trusting in God, trusting in his, that he is judge and ruler and king overall like there's i mean just like we said at the very beginning like nothing is above him i can't sue him i, I his law his his righteousness is is all in all and i and, and i just trust that i just trust that um and so let so what so one of the questions that the lord um that i felt he said to me when I was studying this out, he said, what makes a person right? I was like, Ooh, that's good. Lord. What, <laughs> makes a person, what makes a person right? And so when I thought about it from the world standpoint, I said, well, if I'm right about something, you know, we always say I'm right. You know, you're wrong. I'm right. You know? And if you think of it in that sense, it's based on what that person believes to be true exactly the truth and so it's what he believes to be true in accordance with their conduct their standards their belief right that's really good <laughs> so, so easily i can fight with someone and say um if we're arguing about something and i'm like no i'm right it's going to be based on what I believe to be true, the standards that I have set for myself and, and go accordance with, and not yours, right? Yes. And then they're fighting you from that standpoint. Well, being right in that sense is wrong. <laughs> 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 it's wrong. <laughs> So we fighting about who's right and we both wrong because both what, wrong. We sh what we should be going towards is true righteousness. What is right in the sight of God? Mm. And that is, it's going to be based on what a person believes to be true in accordance with God's conduct, his behavior, and his standards. And that's the difference between, so, so when you want to say that I'm right, you're really acting in a self-righteous manner. That ain't, that doesn't make it right. It has to be in accordance with the law, the standard of God and his righteousness. And the truth of the matter is that's how God judges. So God judges based on his standards. And we can't, I read something, it said, God is not subject. I had to write it down because I got it from somewhere. And it's so good because it says, God is not subject to anything outside himself. 
Mm -hmm. He ain't subject to our laws of the United States. He's not subject to our opinions and what we believe. He's not subject to, it's 2022, um, the, uh, I'm, I don't have to follow the Bible. He ain't subject to none of that. Mm -hmm. He is uninfluenced by anything that is not of himself. That's really. <laughs> like the end. Yes. I can drop the mic on that one. No. Yes. yes. So we have to realize that his laws are his is what he judges. His word is what he judges. And if you're not living according to that, you're not living according to righteousness. It is so, so, the, so it's like what you said when you were talking about the definition, you know, from the world standpoint, and even going back to um, Abraham, why he was counted as righteous because he believed. And to part of that belief, believing which the Lord counted him as righteous is there's an action attached to that belief. So it's not just, yeah, I believe you're God because they say the demons believe, but they're still, you know, it's like, there's an action. There is a movement attached to that, that you, that belief propels you to walk in the ways of the Lord. It propels you to want to do what's right in his sight. Amen. To, you know, to um, what you said, to lay down your uh, self-righteousness, your um, wanting to be justified in the situation and be okay with God's, you know, um, his say in the matter. Because it oftentimes, as you know, Joel can be very different from what we come up with, you know. And so in those moments, bowing down to him and his righteousness, and that's because we believe who he says that he is, which causes an action. It causes an action. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Um, in Romans 4, it talks about Abraham, who we just finished talking about, and it says, in Romans um, 4, 2, if, for if Abraham was justified, that is, he was quitted, acquitted from the guilt of sins by works, those things he did were good. He has something to boast about, but not before God. Well, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in God, and it was credit to his account as righteousness, right living, right standing with God. So the action is that we have to live right. Yes. yes. We are we are the righteousness like our faith in Christ is considered righteousness. Our faith is so we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? We all we all know that as as Christians. But there is an action that also goes with it that we have to live according to the things that God is telling us to do in his word. And one of the things that Patrice and I were talking about earlier um, is that even, even um, we were talking about the book of Hosea and, you know, people, people, the word of the, the word is the Lord, right? The, the, the word of God is the word of God, but there is a specific thing that the, that God may tell you to do. And if you don't do that, then you are not doing a righteous thing. So for example, Hosea was told from God to marry a prostitute. Now, Hosea could have been like, no, that would have been his self-righteous act because he's like, I ain't marrying no prostitute, Lord. And then when he married her and had children, she had children by another person, he could have been like, oh, the Bible says that I can 
put away my wife who commits adultery. It's in the word, right? Right. So he, can, he can hit the hit guy with the word, but God is saying, what did I tell you to do? That trumps that. Yes. Because one, because one, even in the Bible, when it gives you a way, a way of escape, if you, if your spouse commits adultery, but it says, I only gave permission for, um, for divorce because of the hardness of your heart. It was never intended to be like that. Yes. So, yes. so that's one thing, but two, when God tells you to do something, when you hear the voice of the Lord regarding your life, if you don't do that, you are not being righteous, obedient to what he's telling you to do. So everybody would think, oh, Hosea, you know, you married a prostitute. Like you did not hear from the Lord. Definitely. Because, <laughs> because the world and people have this have this idea of what is right but god if you think about it all throughout the bible god goes against the 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 norm right the norm exactly <laughs> he goes against the norm yes. like what yes yes and so your righteous acts to me, is really your obedience to do what God is telling you to do. Exactly. And when you don't do that, because it's your faith, like, so we know that faith, those righteous acts are also because you had faith in, in God when he said to do something and you did it, the action, that means that you're, that is a righteous act. And you're in right standing with God. It's when you move from that. Because even, even the Bible says that um, when you go before God and you say, didn't I go to church? Didn't I tithe? Didn't I do all this stuff in your name? And God said, I never knew you. You are a worker of iniquity. You, that means that's sin. You did your own thing, your own self-righteous acts. Yes, yes. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> That's, yeah. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. To stay in our own lanes. We've heard that for so long. And so many times people will get on the pulpit and they'll be preaching that God did this and everybody like, I want that, I want that. No, what did he tell you? you. And what and is for you? Is for you. Right. And stay in your own lane. Yeah. And I personally have to remember to stay in my lane. Like I, you know, I need to, I see things and I'm like, but Lord, Jewel, he has to well, always- too. You have to always stir me back. Jewel, what did I tell you to do? Because there's so much. Yes. There's just so much out there, which as we know, you know, is, is part of the strategy of the enemy um, that we can say, well, of course the Lord would want me to do this or be involved in this or, you know, good things, not even bad things. Bad things, things. that's good true. Things. But it's not what the Lord has for you because you're doing this good thing, but yet neglecting what he has had for you. So who's doing that? Right. So a lot of it, too, is us trusting in the Lord that he is able to take care of it all. He's not um, he don't need our help. <laughs> not at he don't all. need our help, you know. We that need we're him. Gonna help him out because you know maybe ain't nobody covering that. He <laughs> has it all covered, all covered. Yeah, and thank God for the righteous one. I mean, just think about Jesus. So, what if Jesus, who had this, he's called the righteous one, right? And he's the righteous one because he was in right standing with God, 
and he did what God told him to do, right? And he was obedient to that. And his actions, here we go with that too, his actions proved it. But remember, just before that, he said, God, take this cup away from me. Now, God told him he was going to die. He even told his disciples, I got I to go to the cross. I got to die. And they couldn't get it. <laughs> they couldn't get it. And even at that moment, he was like, God, take this cup from me. Yeah. And so even he was like trying to get into his own self-righteousness, like, take this cup from me. But thank God that he said, but not my will, but your will be done. And so then his righteous act that he did because of what God told him to do, he became the righteous one. The only one. And and he said, the only reason why he did it is go back to what you were just saying. The only right reason why he did it because he saw us. He endured the cross for us. What if he didn't do that? What if he didn't do his righteous act? Lord have mercy. <laughs> Where would we be? Ooh, not here, probably. <laughs> <laughs> what? So being in right standing with God and being righteous is really doing what God is telling us to do. The, God is always right. And everything he tells us to do is right. It was just what you were saying, is right. And we have to trust and that's part of the word the, in belief, trust in. Trust in that what he tells us to do is for our good. And because Abraham believed and trusted in the Lord, it counted towards him righteousness. So that's a really good one. I don't want to get off track, but every time I think about Abraham, so, and the Lord is so gracious. But he didn't tell Abraham, bring your cousin Lot and all these other folks, mama and them. He didn't say that. He said, you go. But the Lord still honored that. However, the repercussions of that came with the Moabites. That line that came out of the lineage of Lot because of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time, wrong time. Mm-hmm. Of mm-hmm. so the you know the incest that happened with his children out of that the Moabites were born out of that situation so that would have never taken place if Abraham would have just took him and his wife family like he told him and go on right so going back to what we're saying and even though the Lord still honored but it's like we just have this tendency to add on. (laughs) We just want to add little things on and not realizing the weight that it can cause. And God will allow it. He'll allow things to play out. But it's like, I never told you to bring him. Yeah. And, and And I believe that Abraham probably prayed and was like, cause I, just like, um, when God, uh, uh, who was it? His brother, uh, Moses was it Moses. Yeah. Um, and he, he was like, I can't, God called him to go get the, the children of Israel. And he was like, I can't even speak. And God was like, okay, I'll bring, I'll let you take your brother. I believe that that's how it was with Moses that he was like, oh, okay. It, it, we just don't know the story of that. You know, we don't right, know the right. story of that. But, <laughs> You know, sometimes, you know, we do go to God and be like, oh, God, I don't, I don't want to do this. You know, can I, and his graciousness, his mercy. Yeah, he'll give us that. But um, we have to believe and trust in and rely on him. We have to do what he tells us to do. Yes. That was helps us to me to remain in right standing and his justice, his justice. So let's talk about that for a minute, because his justice you know, one of the things that he showed me is that there is a justice that restores relationships, you know, um, and that's called um, restorative justice, which, um, you know, if somebody has done somebody wrong and, you know, and, or even someone got offended, like me and my friends have broken off 
um, years ago. And I didn't know why, but God always told me he was gonna restore those relationships. That's his justice. All the relationships are restored now. But God separated me from them because he needed to do a work in me for such a time as this. But he restored everything. So that's that's restorative justice. And then there's um, um, retributive justice, which is punishment for wrongdoing. And that people don't understand that side of God because they don't want to see that side because, oh, God is good. God is lovely. And he is. Woo! We know the goodness of God. We know the love of God. But there is a fear of the Lord and there is a holiness to the Lord that we need to reverence above all. And when you don't and you feel like you can still do what you want, when you want, whenever you want, no. Not when you are truly a son or daughter of God. And I'm going to say son and daughter because that to me means a mature one. You know, we're children of God. Yeah, I get it. But we should no longer be children, no longer babes on milk. We should be now sons and daughters, mature, eating meat, coming up to a level and a standard that he has for us. And that's what he's looking for. That's why he wants to recalibrate the church. Too many babes. He wants us to be sons and daughters. So um, in this type of justice, you know, I, he took me to um, what's the uh, Esther, and in Esther, the king had pronounced judgment and and said all the Jews can be killed, right? And he gave his signet ring and told uh, told the guy, yeah, you can kill all the Jews not knowing that his wife was a Jew. So when she found out, she went before him and was like, hey, you trying to kill me? Like, and he's like, what do you mean? That law you put in in place to kill all those Jews? Well, I'm a Jew, you're killing me. And he's like, what, what, who did that? Like, and so she said, well, change it, change the law. And what did the king, now he's a king, but he's a, he's a king on the earth. He is not a holy king. He's a king on the earth. And he himself said it too. He said exactly what God is saying. I'm a king, but I can't reverse my law. So, so if a man can understand that even as a Little key, little K as in king, can't change a law. Then we need to know that the big king of kings, right? <laughs> he ain't changing his laws for us. There's no amendments. There's no amendments. <laughs> and so if he said, he said, I can't change the law, and I'm a king. So when God His justice, when God judges, he's judging people. He's judging the world based on his laws. Not based on what the statutes and the the congressmen and the Senate and all them put into place. He ain't judging based on that. So the justice of God is based on his laws. And until we realize that, and and even in the Old Testament, when we had the law, the law was is that for us to understand that no man can satisfy the law. Like we're so unfit to even satisfy it, but it was supposed to expose our helplessness towards accomplishing God's perfect standard. Exactly, that we can't do it in our own. We can't do it in our own. So Jesus came, Jesus came and and left his Holy Spirit to help us to live in right relationship with God, to live right before God, to be what? Righteous. 
The just shall live by faith. That's the righteous. The, so that's how we're supposed to live according to his laws. And yeah, we're going to be judged. This, is, this, this message is not for people in the world. This message is for the Christian, the one who wants to grow and mature and be in right standing with God, have the character of God. We're going to be judged from the world because the world doesn't understand the things of God. Yes. They don't understand his righteousness. They don't understand his holiness. But we who do know that there's a standard that we have to live by. And when we start to move in that direction, we'll start to see, and they will start to see the sons, what does it say? The whole world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. That's the mature ones. That's not the ones who are still working out their own self-righteousness because I want to do what I want when I want and God is okay with it. We bring him down to a lower version instead of... A, holding him up high, we say, you know what, God, we're going to do what we want, when we want, and you're going to be okay with it because of your grace and well, your love. Yes, and we, we really make him into our image and likeness. And he ain't going for that. He that's ain't what we're doing. No, he's not. And that's the thing, Joel, too, is the church, you know, back in the day in the Old Testament, he, you know, he would say in his, through his prophets, like, you're worse than the world. Like, you're, they're not even, you're, they're not even doing the things that you're doing. So the, the justice of God, the judgment is going to be more severe for his people. Because just like we would tell our own children, you should know better. I did not raise you like that. Right. Isn't that how we talk to our children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the children of the Lord, his church, that is going to experience, you know, uh, a severity of the Lord. But it's not to destroy us. It is no. his redemptive purpose in it it is to bring forth righteousness you know like in I think it's Isaiah when he talks about the daughters of Zion being purified by the fire there has to be a true coming into alignment with the Lord there has to be and there will be there will be and Amen. we are absolutely tasting some of that we have been but as we know there is going to be a ramping up of those judgments and it's for the purpose to to cause us to turn true repentance to cause us to turn away from our self-righteousness like you said to the righteousness of the lord and that's so good because repentance, a lot of times we think it's just saying, I'm sorry. And it's not just saying, I'm sorry, even though that's a start, but it's actually making that 180 degree turn to actually turn away from what we're doing that's not pleasing to him to what is pleasing to him. That's okay. true. That's true repentance. It says that your repentance, you will see the fruit of repentance, which means that there's a change. There's a difference. Because he even speaks to that, um, I can't, was it Isaiah, where he says, you know, basically don't rend your garments and put ashes all over you. So basically don't give me your lip service, you know, what you're saying, the I'm sorry, you're fasting and all of that grandeur, and you're still doing the same thing you want to do. 
Amen. You're still putting your will before my will. You're still unwilling to open your heart up to receive the power that can make you righteous. Amen. You know? That's right. Because that power, that sin, that's not pleasing to God, it is the Holy Spirit that will help you when you're open up to it to help you to no longer live in that sin. It takes time. I mean, so when you when you see a sin that you know is not pleasing to God, you have to go to God and say, God, you know what? I know this doesn't please you. I want to please you. Help me to turn away from this. I know I can't do it on my own. That's when you allow him in and you allow the Holy Spirit. So then what will start happening is that, say, if you're drinking and, and you want to stop that, what will happen is you'll go to pick up that, that glass and the Holy Spirit will say, no, go get some water. Now, here's the struggle. Yes. <laughs> I, I want that glass of liquor. But he told me to go get water. It's not going to satisfy my taste. Here is where you make the decision. Now, sometimes you're going to drink that glass of liquor. And you may fall a couple of times when he tells you, nope, nope, don't do that. But then you will get to a point where you will say, because you've already opened up and let him in to help you, you're reading his word, you're in praise and worship, you're, you're in his presence, and you're understanding that, oh, you know, I have this desire is becoming greater that I don't want this liquor anymore. Yes. And then yes. when you take that drink, when you go to get one of them, you're like, I'm gonna get the water today. And you're gonna be so happy. You're gonna be like, yes, I did not drink that liquor today. Yes. And that's where, too, what you just said, which is so good when you're faced with, you know, the choice, that's where grace, true grace steps in. Yes. True grace steps in and gives you the supernatural power to choose what is right. Yeah. And like you say, you may not always get it because I, I am still there. I mean, yeah. I'm not liquor or whatever, but there are still things that are right. not right in the sight of the Lord in my own heart. Exactly. Those attitudes, wanting to do my thing, my way, that's still not pleasing to him. That's exactly. still Sabrina wanting her own way. So even in where I am, I've noticed that just being real with the Lord, like, Lord, we really don't want to do it your way. Holy Spirit, please come help me in this moment to do it the way I know you want me to do it. And I'm telling you, there is, it's not all the time, but it is most of the time. He really does come in and gives us that supernatural ability to bow our flesh yeah. to the spirit. And that yeah. is true grace. That's, that's and, true. And, that, and that grace is not, you know, when we talk about grace, grace is not for us to keep sinning and God saying, it's okay, it's okay. People got that twisted. The true grace is that when you fall and you get back up and you try it again, and then you get the ability to pick the right thing versus the wrong thing, that's where the grace comes in. The and so the supernatural grace. And even Paul, Paul says, it in, I think it's in Acts, in one of the um, books that he wrote, that I struggle to do what's right and I'm, I have this, this thing. We all have that thing. But we can overcome, we can overcome it by his grace, the yes. supernatural power that you were just mentioning. So then you, you drink that water and you're so happy. And then the next day you drink the water, you're so happy. Then the next day you may fall and you're like, oh, well, there's no condemnation. God is, there's no condemnation. And all he's going to do is say, okay, baby. You fail this time, it's okay. Get back up and let's try it again tomorrow. And then instead of two days being good and one day off, you're you're three days good and one day off. And then you, you know, and then you it and then you grow and then it becomes to where you look up and you're like, I don't drink anymore. It's not even a struggle. It's not even a struggle. <laughs> So, I mean, but you you may have to get away from those friends that you like drinking with yeah. because we're, we're, we're people of habits. 
And so, you know, I know for me, if I go to a certain place in, in Waldorf, for example, if I go to Wal if I go to Waldorf for anything, I gotta go to this place to get these, these eclairs. And I know are 4,000 calories and that I should not be eating, right? <laughs> because a habit of water, there's that place. <laughs> and I have to stop myself and say, Jewel, you don't have to go to this place every single time you go to water. Like what? Yeah. So, so we have to, there are things that we have to do. We have to change our mindset. We've got to change um, sometimes the people that we hang with. You know, like I told you, God took my friends away from me because he knew that he wasn't going to get me alone because I was so connected to them. We did everything together. And he's like, I need to separate her from, from them. He was, but the relationship is restored, but he had to do that. So sometimes you thinking, you know, I was like, why did I lose all my friends? And the Lord was like, I did that. And we don't know why he does what he does, but now, you know, 30 years later, I understand. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be where I am if I was still hanging out at the clubs, you know? I so know. Um, so in pursuing, this is what we're talking about is pursuing righteousness. Because even though the Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't mean that we can't be righteous. It doesn't mean, it tells us that we are to pursue and go after righteousness. And what we just described is pursuing righteousness. So it can be done and you can't overcome sin. You don't have to live in sin. And that is the perfect life that God has for us is to get us out of sin so that we can live a righteous, holy life before him and get way more than we could ever get from this world. This world has nothing to offer us that's good. And that's only because we haven't seen with our spiritual eyes and haven't really developed an intimate relationship with the Lord to see that there is a better life. There is freedom. There's freedom. Yes. Yes. There's freedom from sin. There's freedom from bondage. There's freedom from sickness and disease. There's freedom from that. And he wants to free us. And that's the only reason why he wants us to live a certain way is not to be a dictator and to tell us what to do. He's moving us into freedom and life in him that is so better than what we can even imagine, not only here, but preparing us for what's to come too, when, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign a thousand years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that's so good too, Jill, because he's asking us to do something that he's equipping us to do. Yes. So he's not asking us to do something that we're not capable, but it's the partnership. He's like, I am that. So you with me, the abiding you and me, and I in you, like, I got you. I got you. It's not like the, you know, the programs, the, the different, you know, the self perfection programs that we have out here. It's not mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. It becomes a natural thing, what you're saying, just the relationship where it's not a chore. Oh God, I got to do this, or I can't do that anymore. Or, I can't, I can, uh, no, it becomes a true lifestyle of growing, you know, with him. And in that growth, as you're saying, the more that we yield to really his love, that makes us righteous, um, it, it becomes, it, it's a joy. It really is a joy. It really, it really is. is. It yeah. really is a joy, you know, and not to say that it's all flowers and, you know, butterflies. No, because we're going to have hard times, but wouldn't you rather go through those hard times with the creator of all things, 
with your eternal father. I mean, you know, wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't you rather ex go through those things with him, the one that can um, get you through it? Right. And without him? I mean, I would. I can't even imagine not living like this and not. not <laughs> It's not fun. I've tried it without him. I have too. And I, I there's there's no going back because I know no. too much. No. I know too much. I've seen too much. I've been delivered from too much. Yes. I'm in a much better state right now than I was last year, the year before, <laughs> 20 years ago. Like yes. I was a hot mess, you know, and he cleaned me up. He cleaned me up. Yes. Yeah. He did a work. I had to do some work too. It was like you said, it was a partnership. I had to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to put this down. You told me to put it down. I'm going to put it down. And I know about falling and getting back up and falling and getting easier and easier and then falling again and feeling like I, I, you know, in condemnation because I, I failed God and he's like, no, baby, you trying, like you, you, you trying to live righteous is better than you could ever be trying to make an excuse. Yeah. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience, yeah. he's, he's, he'd rather you at least see that you're trying. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. points, that's points with him. But just saying, I can't live holy or I can't live righteous or I, you know, because of whatever, that's an excuse because we really can. Jesus came, died, and left the Holy Spirit for us to be able to live this kind of life that God is expecting us to live. And you can do it. Any of us, we can do it. So Lord, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that this righteous life that you want us to live, this holy life that you want us to live, that we can do it. We can do it. It says with God, it's impossible. Without God, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. We can do it. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your love. We thank you for your plan. He has good plans for us. All that's going on is all coming to a place where we're going back to the heart of God, which is to dwell with us in a perfect world where there is no sickness, there is no disease, there is no... no um, people, you know, robbing you or, you know, it, like we're moving back. He's trying to get us back to that place. So it's good. His plans are good towards us and his patience, even though it's been 2000 years and everybody's like, oh, he, we've been talking about Jesus coming back, you know, for the last 2000 years. Well, guess what? You better be thankful that he ain't come back yet. He's given his, <laughs> right. how, how his patience to get people prepared for Jesus' coming, you know? Yes. You don't want to be left behind. Amen. So thank you guys for coming and listening to our Bible study tonight. Um, this will, next week will be the last week that we'll be doing Facebook Live. I just wanted to start out on Facebook Live. We're gonna move over to YouTube. So make sure you go to my YouTube channel, um, Joara Powell, and subscribe. And we will have Bible study on YouTube um, starting in April. So don't forget to go get your free book. It's free, yes. free, free. Yes, and it's and good, open. good, good. <laughs> It's an open invitation. You can go to kingdomreignministries.com and just know that uh, the heart of this ministry 
is to prepare people to become the bride and get them ready for Jesus' second coming. That's all we're trying to do. God wants to recalibrate his church to make sure that as many that can go and with him first round, we want to be first round draft picks. <laughs> we don't want to be left behind. And so this is what this ministry is about, is preparing the brides for his second coming. So love you. Peace. We'll talk to you later. Thank you so much, girl. Thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you.